All right, welcome everybody to the University of New Mexico Lawn Mental Health Didactics Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have you all here joining us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, Next week, don't forget, we have Dr. Jerry Kucher, who is presenting on children's competence in forensic context, so don't miss that. Um, for our talk today, please ask your questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable. Just know we're not going to get to them until the end of the talk. As always, we try our best to get to as many of your questions as possible, but please forgive me ahead of time if we can't get to yours. For those of you who want CEs but are on a tight schedule today, you do have to stay for the full hour, but you don't have to stay longer than that. So if for some reason we stay on longer to address questions, we will let you know when the talk is officially ended. Um, and, and you're welcome to log off at that point. For those of you who want CMEs, those are the medical CEs, go to the chat box now, and that's where you'll find the link for that. Now, those of you that want the APA CEs or the other mental health CEs, you wanna wait till the end of the talk today. So at the last five minutes, we're gonna post um, a link to our survey, click on that, fill it out, and then you wanna print a copy, save a copy, screenshot a copy, do something with it. We don't email those out. So uh, again, wait until about the last five minutes of the talk today. As for the recording and the PowerPoint, we will be sending those out or uploading them in about a week. Uh, so give us about seven days. If you don't see it after that, just let us know. Um, I think that's everything for announcements. So now I'd like to introduce to you uh, our speaker for today, my friend and colleague, Dr. Rick Demir. Dr. Demir is a board certified clinical psychologist who specializes in forensic assessment. He practiced clinical and forensic psychology at the US Medical Center for Federal Prisoners for 22 years. Um, he retired there at the end of 2016, and he's now engaged in, in uh, independent practice related or limited to uh, forensic psychology. He's been a member of the Faculty of Examiners for the American Board of Forensic Psychology, as well as the Board of Directors for that organization. And among many other publications, he contributed a chapter, Forensic Report Writing, to the second edition of the Handbook of Forensic Psychology. Um, he's co-author of the book, Forensic Reports and Testimony, A Guide to Effective Communication for Psychologists and Psychiatrists. And he's also a really nice person with a great sense of humor. Uh, Dr. Demir, thank you so much for being willing to present for our series today. I'm truly honored to welcome you, and I want you to know that we're so grateful for your time and expertise. Um, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Julie. It's an honor to be here. I, I uh, hope people enjoy this uh, presentation. Um, so there's the brief biography that you just read, so I will not go through that again. Some information in the slideshow about receiving continuing education credits. I think you also covered that. And here are the standard, well, here are the standard disclosures. Uh, I don't have any financial arrangements uh, that are relating to the content of this presentation. And as usual, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker. They're, they're my views. They don't necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the University of New Mexico. Although some of them might, I'm going to argue for good forensic practice. I imagine the University of New Mexico agrees with that position, but I don't know. I haven't read all their policies and procedures. So. Um, having a, a little bit of a problem with my slideshow, sometimes when I advance to a slide, I get a blank screen. If I go back and advance again, then I get the text. So I apologize to everybody who's watching uh, for that clunky kind of presentation, but that may be necessary from time to time. And while I'm apologizing for stuff, um, let me also say I recognize I have kind of a hoarse voice today. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I didn't get COVID for the first two and a half years, but it finally caught up with me last month. And uh, that's my, why my voice is a little hoarse right now. I do think it'll hold out for the hour though. So let's talk about these learning objectives. Uh, first, uh, I, I hope that after this talk, you're able to recognize 
both the rational and the ethical bases for some of the recommendations we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, differentiating between relevant and non-relevant aspects of a forensic psychological report. And that's not particularly well written. Hopefully there won't be any non-relevant aspects in your report, but we're going to talk about um, relevant and non-relevant data that should go into the report. And then finally, hopefully you'll be able to identify a couple of ways that research within the legal community could inform the way that practitioners write reports. I want to start by uh, thanking some individuals. Um, Dan Krause, Dave DiMatteo, and Kyle Schur. Dave DiMatteo and Kyle Schur are editing a new book, The Oxford Handbook of Psychology and Law. And they asked Dan Krause and I to submit a chapter, which we did. It's not out yet. I think it's going to be out in January. Uh, but the chapter is called Forensic Report Writing, Proposing a Research Agenda. And that chapter is really what I'm basing this talk on. Um, you know, it, it's funny. When I was asked to do this talk, uh, there are some parameters I had to stay within. And one of the things that I was uh, told I need to do is present the source and type or level of evidence to the learners in my presentation. In other words, are the things I'm talking about from animal studies, are they from randomized controlled trials, are they from meta-analyses? And that makes a lot of sense. I, I think throughout the series for the um, many presentations that I have attended, people do a very good job at presenting the source and type of level of their evidence you, you know just where their information is coming from. And that's good because, you know, we're psychologists uh, or mental health professionals of some sort. And, and as such, we're socialized to value the empirical data. And, and as important as that is, the sad truth of the matter is that there's not much empirical data about forensic reports. Some things have been written. There have been some, some research studies that look at the content of the reports. There have been fewer studies that look at the quality of reports. But a lot of what uh, we're dealing with here is just guidance from people um, who, who have ideas that they want to share. They're, they're not empirical. Um, and there's a lot of guidance available about writing forensic reports. And a lot of that guidance is consistent across different sources. I think it's good. Um, I, I've written part of that myself, as Julie said. I wouldn't write it if I didn't think it was true and helpful. Um, but I think we're kidding ourselves. We think this is a area of psychology that has been heavily studied uh, through an empirical lens. The guidance, instead of empirical, tends to be rational. There's a reason for the recommendations that have been made. Um, and some of those reasons are ethical in nature, you know, or at least they have an ethical foundation. Um, yeah, so I don't want to minimize the stuff that's out there. It's, it's based on something like a solid understanding of our role, like a solid understanding of, of ethics. Um, but where's the empirical support for some of these report writing truths that we seem to hold as self-evident? In the chapter that Dan Krause and I wrote, uh, that's one of the fo one of the areas that we focus on is not just where is the empirical support, but what sorts of questions could be answered um, by by good empirical research in this area, and how will those uh, answers to our questions influence the way that we write reports? So. Like I said, this is rational guidance and it's informed by ethics. There are you know, several things at the outset that just make a lot of sense. Uh, the first is to clearly articulate what the psychological or psycholegal referral question is. And I'll bet that a lot of people watching this have had this experience, and I know I've had it, where you get a call from an attorney and the attorney says something like, ah, I got this guy who just kind of seems off. Can you take a look at them and tell me what you think's going on? And a lot of times it's part of our role to clarify what it is that we're answering. Um, and sometimes we're good at that. 
at least for me, sometimes I'm not so good at that. Sometimes I don't get much more than I got this guy who seems off and I really need to understand him better. And so I'll ask the attorney, you know, what, what is it that you need to know? How can I help? What's the actual referral question? And if I don't get an answer, if I don't get a clear answer, I'm going to put in my report what I think the answer is. In other words, I'm going to put in my report the psycholegal referral questions that I'm answering so that uh, the reader can see just what my focus was. Another uh, bit of rational guidance that, you know, again, is um, common uh, among people that have written about this is to describe the notification process, including an assessment of how well your explanation was understood. Now, when I talk about the notification process, I'm talking about the limits of confidentiality. I'm talking about explaining to the person that you're evaluating what you're doing, why you're doing it, how the information is going to be used, um, th things of that nature. This is the area of report that some people have called a forensic warning. I don't like that term. I don't like calling it a warning because I think a warning is necessary when danger is afoot. But there's really nothing dangerous about a psychological examination. I think you should be clear about how the information could be used, especially if it might be adverse to that person that you're evaluating, but it's not a dangerous process. The other thing that, that concerns me is, uh, at least in criminal forensic psychology, which, which is where I've practiced, um, people tend to be very familiar with the Miranda warning. And I don't want them to confuse what I'm doing or what my role is with the people that have given them Miranda warnings in the past. Another bit of forensic guidance or rational guidance is to list your sources of information and list sources that you tried to get but weren't received. And I, I know that many, many people have had this experience. Uh, certainly, I remember a particular case where I was working in an inpatient facility I tried to get some information. It wasn't forthcoming. I wrote the report. I indicated in the report that um, I didn't get the information I was looking for. And it was, I promise you, a solid year. I'd forgotten all about the case and here come these records. So I don't know if you've had experiences like that or not, but uh, they do happen. Um, I think listing all our sources, including sources that we didn't get, shows transparency, <clears throat> shows good faith. Finally, conclusions and opinions should be explicitly linked to the, to the data that underlie them. This is a great example of what most experts believe to be a very important concept. There's some published research about this, but that research is really about whether or not people are doing it, not whether or not it leads to better reports. I'm convinced that it does lead to better reports, but I'd like to see some empirical support for that. It seems obvious. And, you know, when I'm thinking about obvious things, I like to go to my favorite news source, The Onion, America's finest news source. And I remember this headline. This one's always stuck with me, even though it's 20 years old now. Teen sex linked to drugs and alcohol, report center for figuring out really obvious things. This idea that there's a center for figuring out really obvious things resonates with me because I think they might be able to uh, do some work in this area and see if the things that we think are really obvious are really true. I suspect that most of them are, but again, I'd like to see some empirical support. Um, the advice that you find in the available literature in this, in this area appears sound on its face, it seems to be rooted in common sense, but I think there are still some empirical questions worth exploring. Um, and I think maybe it's time to challenge some of the assumptions we have about how reports are used. Um, how are they used? I don't know. I, I haven't been in the judge's chambers when he or she is, has opened up a forensic report. There have been cases that I've been involved in where it was pretty clear that the judge read the report carefully, probably read the report multiple times. But I don't know how often that happens. Uh, when I was working with Dan Krause on this book chapter, 
he used the, the phrase, the last page problem. And that's something that certainly resonated with me. How often do the people who receive our reports just flip to that last page? How often do they just want to see what the answer is? If it's a competency evaluation, are they looking for a thumbs up or thumbs down? And are they reading the rest of it? I don't know how often that happens. But I think there are probably some things that we can do in our reports to increase the chance that they're going to be carefully read. So in the book chapter that I'm basing this talk on, uh, Dan Krause and I tried to recommend uh, various practice points, you know, various guidelines, um, and we tried to describe what their rationales were. Why do we think this is a good idea? A lot of times there are practical reasons or ethical reasons to follow that advice, but we both thought they were still research questions that are worthy of further study. And so as I go through this slideshow, I think what I'm going to do is, is talk about what's recommended and then maybe bring up some questions that, uh, that some researchers could look at to see if the advice is really on target, if it really makes a difference. The first area is one that um, I've thought about for a long time. I recommend writing forensic psychological reports in first person voice. In other words, use the words I and me. I would avoid this examiner or the undersigned evaluator. You know, you're not fooling anybody. They know who you are. And um, so I just, I think it's easier to just say I and me. I think first person voice is, is easier to write. I think it's easier to understand. It's easier to read and it, it seems more authentic. Um, I've never understood the rationale for referring to myself as the undersigned evaluator and they have to flip to page nine to see, what, see who I'm talking about. I did a lot of uh, workshops on forensic report writing for the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. I don't know how many I did, but I, I did them uh, for, for a long time, probably off and on for about 10 years. And I would go to these workshops and see people that I had seen in previous workshops. And the most common feedback I got from people is they said, thanks for getting me to write in first person. I, I really prefer that now. So my challenge to those of you out there who are referring to yourself as the undersigned evaluator is write one report in first person voice and see how it feels. Um, whatever your hesitation is, get over it from one report. You can always go back and change it if you hate it, but more often than not, people don't go back. More often than not, they, they stick with first person voice. So I think these are valid arguments. Um, but I don't know that they are. Maybe they're just a stylistic preference. Maybe there's no measurable advantage or disadvantage, um, especially from the standpoint of the person that's reading the report. You know, just because it's the way that I like to write reports doesn't necessarily mean that it's any better. And I would like to see some empirical uh, studies to see whether or not it does make a difference. Another area I'd like to talk about is uh, excluding irrelevant racial or ethnic identifiers. I've seen so many reports throughout my career where the only mention of race or ethnicity is in the first line of a report. How many reports have you seen that begin with so-and-so is a 33-year-old white woman or you know, so-and-so is a 19-year-old African-American male? Um, if that's the only place it's mentioned in the report, why mention it at all? I don't think we need that as an identifier to make sure we're evaluating the right person. And I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here because I said male. Um, I, I like to refer to people as men and women. I, I think, I just think that's more humanizing, less clinical. I think male and female work better as adjectives than they do as nouns. But anyway, back to your regularly scheduled presentation. Um, <clears throat> There's a great article about this uh, that was written by Christine Riggs Romaine and Antoinette Cavanaugh, and it's included in the uh, 
10 or so sources that I have listed at the end of this slideshow. If you have not read that article, I really strongly encourage it. It's fantastic work. Um, one of the problems with including these identifiers is I think it can precipitate some implicit bias. And we don't, we should not assume that we're going to have the same reactions to that information as other people will. So just to expand on that a little bit, um, when I read about a person's ethnicity, it might help me generate some hypotheses. Uh, for example, if I read that somebody was raised on a Native American reservation, I might have, I might generate the hypothesis that this person had fewer resources. If I read about an African American person in an inner city, I might conclude that that person was more susceptible to racial profiling or may have had negative interactions with the law enforcement community or the criminal justice system. Those are the things that come to mind for me, but I don't want to make the mistake that those are the same things that will come to mind for other people. I have no idea what's going to come to mind for the attorney or the judge that's reading this. I need to acknowledge that my reader might have very different things come to mind, either consciously or unconsciously, than I did. So <clears throat> unless this identifier is relevant to the case, and certainly sometimes it will be, but usually in my experience it's not, but sometimes it will be, but unless it is, I just leave it out. Um, so I, I told you why I think that it might make a difference, why my hypotheses might be different than my reader. But is that really the case? You know, how do legal consumers respond when they see that information? Do they have reactions to it? I don't know. Um, how do we decide when to include such information? That's also uh, fertile ground for some empirical questions. Avoid biased language. It's another uh, tried and true recommendation. There's been a lot of attention given to biased language and efforts to minimize it. One of the things that Neil and Brodsky in a fantastic 2016 article talk about is choose your words carefully because that's a way to address bias. If you can get value laden language out of your report, that's going to minimize bias. Um, I think a lot of words that are biasing are very subtle. I mean, you don't see very many uh, evaluations of child custody that's, you know, talk about this deadbeat dad. I mean, that, it's easy to leave the obvious stuff out, but subtle things have biases. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is the word admit. And I think as a general rule, people admit to things that are bad. People admit to committing crimes. People admit to dropping out of school. Um, I haven't seen a report ever that said the defendant admitted to graduating from college with a master's degree or the defendant admitted to being a decorated military veteran who received a bronze star. So just by using the word admit, I think there's a risk for a, a subtle bias. Another word like that is refused. Uh, when I do forensic evaluations, I typically tell the people that I'm evaluating, they can choose whether or not to talk to me, they can choose whether or not to complete the tests that I'm recommending, if I want to give somebody an MMPI, um, and that person doesn't want to take an MMPI, I don't like using the word refuse. I don't want to say they refuse psychological testing because that connotes obstinance. That connotes, you know, something negative about that person. I'll say that they declined to take the examination or to take uh, that measure. It's a subtle difference. I think it's a real difference. I think it's a real difference, is it? That's one of the questions that uh, we pose in this book chapter. What's the real impact of biased language? Does it affect how people perceive the report? Does it affect legal outcomes? I don't know, I'd like to know. 
Here's another one. Focus on the forensic issue that's of interest to the court. Um, Alan and Grisso wrote an, an, another really good article that's in the references in 2014 about uh, the ethical principles that underlie forensic psychology. And they talk about fidelity and responsibility. Fidelity in this context refers to the psychologist's duty to be faithful and trustworthy and to honor their obligations to provide information in a manner um, that fulfills their agreement to perform the forensic services. Um, and they talk about how this focus on the forensic question helps them stay within the bounds of the referral question and, and increases the fidelity. Um, I wonder how much attention legal consumers pay to this aspect of report fidelity. That is, does it affect the extent to which they rely on our reports? Does it affect the weight they give to our reports? More questions than answers. I mentioned this one before, it's important to document all, all your sources. Um, is there a difference between a source that's reviewed and one that's relied upon? And do you make that difference clear in your report? Um, surely you reviewed sources that weren't particularly relevant. I remember one time I had a, uh, an evaluation where the attorney sent me a ton of records. And in those records uh, were medical records from the defendant's trip to the emergency room as a five-year-old because he had swallowed a nickel. Now, this person was in his, I don't know, 30s or 40s or 50s when I evaluated him. But um, here I had this, this record of this ER visit. And you know the ER doc said, well, kids do that sometimes. Let us know if there are any problems. It wasn't in any way relevant to the forensic referral question. At that point, I did not separate it out, uh, but that's why I, I start around that time is why I started thinking about, do I need to list sources that I reviewed and separately from sources that I relied upon? I think listing all your sources, including those sources you didn't get your hands on, as I said before, demonstrates good faith and due diligence. Other differences? and how these reports are perceived? Are they considered more transparent or better or more credible or more objective by the report readers? I don't know, I would like to know. I think it's very important in forensic work to rely on relevant information. And in fact, I've um, throughout my, my career, uh, relied on some of Tom Grisso's work in, in this area where he said, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but you know, relevance should dictate what's included in and what is included, excluded from forensic reports. It's all about relevance. Um, and I think the best way to define relevant information is that it's information that leads you closer to or further away from an opinion. In a lot of ways, I think it's analogous to the legal concept of whether something is probative. You know, does you know, probative evidence lead you closer to or farther away from a particular conclusion? Same thing with relevance in forensic psychological reports. And our, our task <clears throat> is to rely on relevant information because when we do that, our, our opinions are better understood and they're more defensible. To me, it's all about connecting the dots. I, I like this analogy of connecting the dots. The dots are our data points. And I'm sure most of you, like me as a little kid, did connect the dots in school or in you know, coloring books or wherever, where you draw the line from one to two to three and so on, and a picture emerges. And I like to think of forensic report writing like that. We arrange the dots in such a way that when we link them together or when the reader links them together on his or her own, they form a picture and that picture answers the referral question. But this whole idea of relevance is, is a tricky one uh, for a few reasons. First, if you're in the habit of writing a report a certain way, 
And there are things that you always include without really thinking about whether or not they're relevant to the particular question. That's, that's an old habit that's hard to get rid of. You know, for example, I've seen many, many reports that talk about military service, which I think can be relevant, you know, depending on the context of the evaluation, that can be relevant, it isn't always. Um, but I've seen reports with a section titled military service and one sentence in that section that says this defendant reported you know, never serving in the military. That, that just seems odd to me. I remember Randy Otto uh, said that you might as well have a section that says um, circus participation. This defendant never ran away and joined the circus. If the person never did it, it just does not seem to be as relevant. Um, so if the goal is to write a report that's laser focused on relevancy, um, then the results in the reports are going to look different because I think we all have different ideas about what is or isn't relevant. And I think there's, you know, again, some fertile ground for research here. How is relevance determined? Can we operationalize it? Um, do different clinicians agree about the relevance of certain facts in a given report? And in some, of course, they will, and the obvious ones, but I think there's a lot of room for disagreement here among honest and well-trained people. Also, what do legal consumers think about the relevance? Do they rate relevance the same way as clinicians do? Another piece of advice is to separate facts, inferences, and opinions. I think it's important to link opinions to the facts and inferences that underlie them. This is consistent with the specialty guidelines for forensic psychology. And I think more importantly, it kind of mirrors the way that judges and attorneys think. If you've worked with many judges and attorneys in a consultative role, uh, I, I know, you know, out off the witness stand, you know, um, to me, this just seems to be how they think. They want to see those explicit links. And I think this becomes even more important when you're considering whether or not a particular opinion is gonna be admissible. Courts are really interested, not just in the facts and inferences, but they're interested in how the expert connects those dots, how they connect the facts and inferences to the expert, under, to the expert opinions that they underlie. So it seems like this should appeal to the legal consumer, right? It seems like this way of thinking should appeal to them. But does it? I don't know. There's another uh, question that some good empirical research could, could shine some light on. I want to talk briefly about minimizing and explaining jargon. And the first thing I wrote here is there's no food feedback loop for a forensic report. And what I mean by that is if you're talking to somebody face-to-face, -face, there's all sorts of cues that you pick up on uh, that tell you whether or not you're being understood. Even on the phone, you can tell if you're explaining something to someone and they tend to get lost. Sometimes you, tell, you can tell because they say, hey, you've lost me. But sometimes you can tell by, by their other reactions, their more subtle reactions or the kinds of questions they're asking. You don't get that opportunity when you're doing a forensic report. You're not gonna be in the room with somebody watching them as they read the report, obviously. So you only have one chance to explain yourself. And so you need to do it well. Um, jargon is an area that loses a lot of people. Now, I think jargon is useful. Let's stop for a second and think about what jargon is. To me, jargon, is a way of expressing very complex ideas in very few words. And our field is full of examples. If I say an idea of reference, most of the people watching this, if not all of them are gonna know what that means. But that's a difficult concept to explain to somebody who's never heard of it before or never, or, you know, never experienced it. 
Same with grandiose delusion. That's um, those two words hold a lot of meaning, um, but it's it's not evident if you're not in the club. If you aren't a mental health professional and don't know what a grandiose delusion is, just saying that somebody you're evaluating has a grandiose delusion is going to be inadequate. You're going to have to explain what that means. Some older research, when I say older research, I mean, you know, research reports going back to the, to the 50s and 60s talk about how jargon is rampant in forensic reports. I think as a field, we're doing better, um, but I still see a lot of jargon in reports. And so it, it gives us some things to think about. How should we communicate these complicated and unfamiliar ideas? What should we assume that, that people know? I think in 2022, it's easy to conclude that most people know what a hallucination is. I think that's probably true just from you know, people that have television sets. They probably have an idea of what a hallucination is, but is it an accurate idea? Or do they think it's seeing somebody in the room with you having a conversation with you? Uh, like you see in the movie sometimes. So when it comes to jargon, I think it's important to carefully explain it. Sometimes it's useful to teach the jargon to your reader. It might be a lot easier to say, here's what this term means, and I'm gonna be using it a few times. And you wouldn't say I'm gonna be using it a few times, but if you know you're gonna be using it a few times, you, you, you explain it to the person in the report, so, so you bring them on board. Um, I don't think that makes sense if you're just using it one time. If you're just using a complicated concept one time, I would just explain it rather than name it. Um, again, what, what would legal consumers prefer? There's a lot of room for research in this area. Would they prefer a careful explanation? Would they prefer a glossary? Would they prefer us to leave those terms out altogether? And more important than what would they prefer is what would be most effective? What's going to help us communicate to them uh, with the least risk of misunderstanding? Speaking of jargon, psychological test scores are jargon. In most cases, they really are. Uh, last week, I gave an IQ test, and the defendant obtained a full-scale IQ score of 92. And when I say that to this audience, I think most people probably have a pretty good idea right off the bat of where this person is intellectually, where, where their functioning is. Randy Otto told a story one time about um, giving a presentation, and in the presentation were three judges and three attorneys, and he asked them, what a normal IQ score was. None of them had an answer. So I think it's easy to assume that people know things that maybe they don't know. So again, lots of, lots of room for jargon and psychological testing. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, you know, if I gave a WACE, I'll date myself and say it was an, a WACE R at the time, and somebody had scaled scores of twos and threes for most subtests, but a nine on block design. My professors wanted me to write that that was a relative strength in visual spatial reasoning. And that phrase, relative strength in visual spatial reasoning, is just loaded with jargon. Um, is your reader going to know the difference between a strength and a relative strength? They're going to say, are they going to think that this person really has a strength in this area as opposed to it just being stronger than? Uh, the other areas, so it's a strength relative to their overall functioning. Um, and what psycho-legal questions really hinge on visual spatial reasoning? When you find one, let me know. So lots of things to consider about psychological testing. Should we include scores in the report? Should we include normative comparisons or you know percentiles or error intervals or confidence intervals. Um, if we do, how should they be presented? Should they be explained in the narrative of the report? Do we uh, put a table right smack dab in the middle of the report? 
I've done that in cases where I thought the test results were important. I put them right in the report, but I've also seen reports where they refer to an appendix that includes all the test scores. I think that can make a lot of, a lot of sense. Psychologists seem to be all over the map in this area. Um, there may be differences based on their training or based on their specialty. I think you're more likely to see scores and reports in a table or appendix format uh, from neuropsychologists. Um, but that's just what I think based on my uh, impressions of having read lots and lots of reports. I don't know that that's true. Um, certainly there are some referral questions that demand specific scores. If you're evaluating somebody to see whether or not that person should qualify for a, an IEP, an individualized education plan, you probably need scores in the report. In certain jurisdictions, if you're doing an Atkins evaluation, in other words, an evaluation of whether or not somebody has an intellectual disability that should preclude them from being considered uh, for capital punishment, uh, some jurisdictions are going to demand specific test scores. Should these test scores be integrated into a coherent synopsis in the text of the report, or should they be addressed individually? I recommend addressing them individually for a couple of reasons. The first is that uh, cognitive psychology tells us pretty clearly, I mean, the research is pretty clear on this, on this point, that we tend to overestimate our ability to integrate a lot of different data points. We're not as good as it as we we're not as good at it as we think we are. Second, and more importantly, I think if we discuss psychological test results individually, it makes it easier to link those results to specific hypotheses or specific conclusions. Obviously, in the forensic psychological report, you want to explain your reasoning. In fact, I would argue that, you know, in an adversarial system, the report isn't going to be much good if the reasoning isn't laid out clearly. An opinion has to be susceptible to challenge on its merits. And if your explanation isn't clear, people aren't going to know whether or not your explanation has merits. They're not going to know whether or not this is a conclusion that should be relied upon. And it's going to be difficult to properly challenge that conclusion. This is something that the specialty guidelines for forensic psychology address explicitly. They say, strive to offer the basis and reasoning underlying the opinions. So I think forensic clinicians tend to accept this guidance. Do legal consumers agree? They probably do, but I don't know that they do. I'd love to see some empirical work that, that answers that question. And I wonder if this is an area where we could address that last page problem. Are there ways that we can explain our reasoning that make it more likely for the uh, recipient of the report to read the whole report? I'm going to talk briefly about addressing the limitations of the report. This is an exp this is a, um, something that's been recommended by lots and lots of people who've written about this, and, you know, an explicit discussion of the limitations of the report is recommended. The specialty guidelines, again, weigh in and are clear. Forensic pra practitioners strive to have readily available for inspection all data which they considered, regardless of whether the data supports their hypothesis. I think this makes a much stronger report. I think including weaknesses of your report in some ways inoculates against challenges. I think it's similar to bringing out the weaknesses of a report during direct examination uh, so it doesn't look like you're hiding them and it doesn't, you know, it reduces the effectiveness of, of bringing those things up on cross-examination. So I'm convinced that it's good practice. Do legal consumers appreciate this? I'm not convinced that they do. I have written reports that have a section about the data that doesn't fit as well or alternative hypotheses or weaknesses of the report. And I've had attorneys say, I don't really want this in here. I think that weakens the position. I've never changed the reports in, in that regard. I've never removed a section because an attorney asked me to. Instead, I will talk to them about the reason that I think it makes it a stronger report. 
and following an explanation, uh, they have typically agreed with me. So, but whether or not they, they actually appreciate that prior to an explanation, I think is an open question. I have some thoughts about presenting a diagnosis in the report, and, and my thoughts are don't separate or highlight them so that the eye is drawn to them. And this really has to do with how the report looks. I think a lot of this might be an artifact of the old DSM system where we saw reports that said, yeah, the following diagnoses are off offered, colon, and then there's a blank space and you see, you know, indentation, axis one, colon, axis two, colon, axis three, colon. <clears throat> just, uh, excuse me, just paging through a report like that, the person's eye is going to be drawn to that offset or emboldened or um, otherwise, you know, the diagnosis is, that's sticking out. And the problem is it may create the impression, again, in a subtle way, that the diagnosis is more important than it really is. Um, several years ago, I stopped capitalizing diagnoses. I learned to capitalize them when I was in graduate school. I never gave any thought to why. Um, it's just, I was told that's how we do it. But if we don't capitalize cancer and we don't capitalize diabetes, I don't know why we're capitalizing schizophrenia. And again, it's very subtle, but I worry that just capitalizing schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder makes, it kind of underscores it in a way that gives it more importance than you really intended. Now, this is just stuff that I think. Does the manner in which diagnoses are presented have any impact on the person reading the report? I don't know. Um, I just think it probably does. But I'd love to see some empirical work that, that addresses that question. Let's talk about the ultimate opinion issue. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Most psychologists know what I'm talking about. Uh, but very briefly, some very prominent authors have said, don't give ultimate opinions in your reports. Other prominent authors have, sa authors have said, it's fine to give uh, ultimate opinions in your reports. So the recommendations about what psychologists should do is inconsistent. And I think what legal consumers want and need tends to vary quite a bit. My take on this is that the whole controversy doesn't matter if you have a well-written report. I think it's a red herring because I think this whole issue is a throwback to the days when psychologists and psychiatrists, and I'd like to think mostly psychiatrists, wrote conclusory reports. You know, I'm thinking about decades ago when somebody's referred for a competency evaluation and the report basically says, this person has schizophrenia and is therefore incompetent. Very conclusory. If the report just gives you a thumbs up or thumbs down, if it just you know, gives you an answer with the reasoning of, because I'm a doctor and I said so, then I think it was right for legal consumers to push back on that. Um, I think if we carefully explain our opinions and we include all the data and we help the person reason along with us and walk through our thinking about this, then the fact finder is free to draw conclusions that are independent of our conclusions. Um, that, that's why I think it's a red herring. In an article from 1998, Jennifer Skeem and Steve Golding went so far as to say that providing an opinion is the least important part of the forensic examiner's task. It's only in failure to explain one's reasoning that you usurp the judicial decision-making role. In other words, if you explain your reasoning carefully in a way that the reader can follow, then they can decide on their own whether or not the opinion has merit, whether or not the opinion should be relied on. It's only if you skip that step and just give them the answer to the ultimate issue that you're taking away their decision-making responsibility or their decision-making opportunity. They're not able to make the decision with the best data available. Yeah. Do attorneys vary in their expectations about 
whether we should address the ultimate issue. And if so, I, I imagine they do. What, what is a variant based on? Does it vary on type of case by jurisdiction or some other median variable? And do legal consumers find these ultimate opinions to be helpful? And when do they find them to be harmful? And are their expectations consistent with the law? I know in the federal system, there is a specific prohibition against giving an opinion during testimony about the ultimate issue of sanity. In other words, somebody in the federal system who does an insanity evaluation cannot testify, it's my opinion this person is insane, or it's my person this person is sane. Can't do it. It's very, very clear. Yeah, it's black letter law. But I've got a colleague who, <clears throat> who talked about going to court. And when he was asked by the defense attorney, what was your opinion? Did you think my client was sane or insane? He looked at the judge and looked around and said, you know, I, I just, I don't think I can answer that. And the judge in a Southern state said, well, hell boy, what do you think we bring you down here for? So sometimes their expectations aren't consistent with the law. And there are times that we as psychologists and other mental health professionals have a better idea of what those parameters are than the people that we intend to serve. So just uh, a few final thoughts to kind of um, wrap things up. And I think we'll have uh, a few minutes for questions before we get to the top of the hour. Um, there's a lot of good report writing guidance available. And again, I've got um, several uh, references in, in the following slides that will be made available to you. I think it's after about a week. If I'm wrong, I'm sure Dr. Bravko will correct me. Um, but there's a lot of good report writing avail uh, guidance available. But that guidance appears to come just from the perspective of the mental health professionals that are writing the reports. We can offer advice about what we think will be most helpful to the, to the courts, but that advice usually isn't verified by empirical evidence from the legal consumers themselves. So in writing this book chapter with Dan Krause, we tried to lay out some questions that we think would be helpful to have answers to. We did not go into a lot of detail about how those, uh, how that empirical work should be done. That was kind of beyond the scope of what we were offering. I think there's a lot there that's worthy of thinking about. So in my remaining slides, I just have some of the uh, some of the references that I relied on, I think would be most helpful to people in this presentation. And that is what I got. Julie, are you there? I sure am. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Um... There's lots of questions. So how would you say your, your reporting has changed in the last 10 years? And what changes do you see in your style in the years ahead? Well, that's a really good question. Um, my, <clears throat> my style has changed in, in a few areas. I, I can't tell you exactly when. I don't remember when I stopped putting man and woman instead of male and female. I can't tell you when I stopped reporting race or ethnicity, but I think that was probably about probably about 15 years ago. And it just, just occurred to me one day that, you know, if the only place I was using this was in the first line of the report, then it probably shouldn't be in there at all. A um, little more difficult to, to pinpoint times on is and because it's been very gradual is I think I'm really focusing more on relevance. When I'm writing a report, each thought, I think, is this a thought that's helpful to the reader to understand my opinion? And if it's not, then I have to think long and hard about why it's there. <clears throat> and the honest answer is sometimes it's there just because that's the way I've always written reports. And that's not a very good reason. So it's a, it's a slog, it's a slow change, but that's how I'm changing. In terms of how I'm gonna change in the next 10 years, um, I have no idea. Hopefully there will be uh, empirical research that comes out that can guide me. And I think the best I can do is just continue to be cognizant of some of the things I've talked about, 
my reports are better now than they were 10 years ago. They were better 10 years ago than they were 20 years ago. I think that's true of all of us. I think report writing is an area where we can always strive to do better. Next question. So in terms of improving the readability of a report, what are your thoughts on departing from a narrative format and transitioning to more succinct formats like bullets or maybe the history section or tables for competency data while keeping narrative paragraphs to a minimum, for example, in the conclusion section? What an interesting idea. Um, I, think, I think a comparison of reports written in both those styles based on the same data given to legal consumers, uh, attorneys and judges would give us the best answer and a, a far more important answer than whatever Rick Demir thinks. Um, I don't, I, I'm just gonna be straight. I don't love the idea because I think that there's something very powerful about a narrative. I think explanations can get lost if you're just doing bullet points or tables. I don't, I don't, think you have the freedom to explain things as, um, maybe freedom is not the right word, but you're not as likely to explain things as carefully if you're trying to just give thoughts that can be digested quickly and easily. But again, it, it's a good empirical question. Um, I've, I've used that technique. I just don't use it a lot, but I've had tables in my reports. Um, when I think that it's going to communicate more effectively, I'll do it. Uh, I had a report I wrote a few years ago where I reviewed lots and lots of records and in those records were lots of reflections of behaviors that supported uh, the presence of a severe mental illness. And so I had three different tables, uh, you know, evidence from the record suggesting this person experiences hallucinations or suggesting this per person experiences delusions. And I just listed them in bullet point form. So th there's certainly places for it. I don't love the idea of um, overdoing it. Do you think that someone's gender identity, cisgender versus transgender, for example, is relevant in a forensic report, specifically if this individual is legally considered the gender of which they present? It's a super complicated issue. I think the answer is going to vary on a case by case basis. Um, I actually had a case where I evaluated somebody, I think it was earlier this year, certainly no more than a year ago, where that became very relevant to the competency of the person. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, in that particular case, uh, the person was transgender but was being identified in court documents and by the prosecuting attorney by the gender that they presented as physically, which was no longer their identity and probably hadn't been for a long time. The problem in that case is that this was such an important issue to this person that he stopped, for, uh, stopped cooperating, stopped working with the attorney until the attorney was able to address this and the attorney wasn't really able to address what other people were doing or saying. So I think there are times that, that it really is relevant. I think there are times that it's not particularly relevant. I think you gotta make that decision on a case by case basis. This next individual says that withdrawing cultural and demographic variables runs the risk of not considering one's blind spots and the impacts of those elements on the case and clinical presentation. How do you ensure you're not engaging in this when you're deleting data? Got a couple of responses to that. First is I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think uh, Tess Neal has written about the forensic blind spot and that I know, I know she's, one of the people that's upcoming in your series I'm really looking forward to. Um, by nature, a blind spot is something that we don't see and we can take concrete steps to reduce the blind spot. But I don't know that we can be eliminate that it can be eliminated. And if we say it can, I don't know that we're being honest with ourselves. The second thing is I'm not eliminating any data. I'm just being thoughtful about what data I include in the report. Um, so these may be things that I'm thinking carefully about, but in terms of communicating what's relevant to the reader, 
uh, there may be times that, that they don't seem to be relevant. I don't know if that really answered the question or not. So for everybody that needs to jump off, we are right at the hour. Um, we've got the, the link in the chat right now for the survey. Make sure you save a copy of it for yourself. Um, Rick, are you okay with us staying on a little bit longer for more questions? I will stay on and as long as my voice will hold out. How's that okay. sound? We'll, we'll do a few more then. Um, so this person says they also take issue with the use of certain words in forensic reports. And the one that they've struggled with lately is the word appropriate, which in their experience is largely used to describe an individual's behavior. For example, person X made inappropriate comments to staff. Their issue is that appropriate can be subjective. We all have different ideas about what behavioral behavior is acceptable versus unacceptable. Do you have suggestions for navigating this? Or maybe do you have alternate phrasing that would be helpful? One of the things I like about doing these workshops is I always get a question that I haven't considered before and a, a question that should be considered. And that's a great one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to wing it. Um, I, I agree that the, the words appropriate and inappropriate are, are somewhat value laden. So I think we just need to be thoughtful about them. Um, you know, I, I worked in a correctional environment for a very long time and I saw behaviors that nobody was going to think were appropriate. So, you know, it, yeah, I, I, won't, I won't go into graphic detail, but I saw things, uh, I saw uh, defendants treating evaluators, you know, with, with language or um, gestures that none of us would think are appropriate. So I, I, I think it's important not to overthink this, but I think it's important to remain cognizant that there is a value judgment when you're using the word appropriate. Now, in terms of whether or not there's a better way to express it, off the top of my head, I say leave appropriate or inappropriate out and just describe the behavior. This next individual says, is the point of indicating someone reported no military service or no trauma history relevant in that it shows this area was addressed? If it's not mentioned, could the assumption be made that it was not addressed during the evaluation? I, I think that's a, a fair point. I've heard that point before. Um, I'm not quite sure how to respond to it. I think that it should be addressed in the interview. I think it usually is. And I just want to have faith that people are going to think that I, I asked the questions that I should have asked and limited the content of my report to what was relevant to the referral question. Um, yeah, I think, again, I think that's a fair point. To me, it's not uh, persuasive. And very smart people disagree with me about all sorts of things. <laughs> um, regarding limitations to a report, would you suggest including them as you go in each section or having one specific section in the report itemizing and explaining them? I think that's going to vary based on the, on the, on the nature of the case and, and the way your report looks and even on your style. Um, typically, when I've done that, I've done it in a you know, standalone paragraph or two. Um, I, I'm having a hard time thinking about how it would look being interspersed throughout the report. Um, I also wonder if you mention weaknesses over and over and over again in various sections, if they're going to have some type of cumulative effect that you know the reader is gonna think, well, this thing was full of weaknesses as, as opposed to a concise explanation of the weaknesses at the, at the end. I don't know that it really matters, but I will probably stick with the idea of addressing them together at the end of a report. Do you include citations or empirical support in your forensic uh, reports? For example, adverse childhood experiences have been shown blah, 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 or the static 99R has been shown blah, blah, blah. And then here's the citation to support these statements. Sometimes, um, I, I 
don't think there's any good research that talks about how often that's used or how often that's done. I just, I don't think we know how often people do that. Um, it's certainly not unheard of. I don't do it in every report. In fact, I probably do it in less than half my reports, but there are times I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't like to use too many footnotes because I think they can look distracting. But I've written reports with 12 to 15 footnotes before. Some of them are citations. Some of them are you know, explanations that aren't as relevant, but I think will help the reader understand. So my answer to the question is, it's all about what's going to communicate most effectively. And at the end of the day, that's going to be a choice that the person writing the report is going to have to make. How do you assess and write about undue influence in your reports? Pass? Is, is pass an option here? Um, <laughs> I've not, uh, I can't recall writing a report where I addressed undue influence. Um, maybe I have at some point, but it's certainly not something I encounter very often. And so I probably don't have anything particularly helpful to say on that. Um, would you ever critique another expert's evaluation in your report? For example, if they did something egregious, like using an inappropriate test, uh, while this could be handled in testimony, not all cases have hearings. I would think that a lot of cases don't have hearings. And, and when you're writing the report, you have no idea whether there will be a hearing or not. So I don't think you should ever say, well, I can just address this in testimony as a reason to not put something in the report. Um, getting to the actual question, the answer is yes. I, I have done that. Um, if somebody writes something that's just, that just doesn't withstand scrutiny, then I will you know, professionally, objectively, and without casting any, you know, um, I'm blocking on the word, but without saying anything bad about the person, I'll just say, I, here are the reasons I don't think this practice stands up to scrutiny. Here, you know, if somebody uses an inappropriate test and, and um, then draws a conclusion from that, I think we have a responsibility to address that with our own work. And I think you can do it without being personal. I think you can do it without being mean. It is what it is. I've, I've seen, like many of us have seen, some egregiously bad work. And sometimes you have to explain why your opinion is different from that. And I can't think of many times I would use the phrase egregiously bad work, but I'll be very specific about the things I disagree with. And I think you can do that respectfully. Do you think that giving the report to someone you evaluated is appropriate? Some reports have disclaimer that the report should be explained by the professional who wrote it and some don't. I think it would be rare that I would do that because I don't think the report usually belongs to me. I think the report belongs to the referral source. Um, if the referral source wants to give the report to the person I'm evaluating, then that's fine. If the person then has questions about it, you know, then the attorney can call me and I can explain things. Um, I've never had that happen. So I, I, I would not provide a copy of the report to, to the person I'm evaluating. Can you go through the second part of that question about the disclaimer again? Um. I think just that some people include a disclaimer in the report about, you know, whether or not it should be given out. Uh, I, I, I also don't think that's our role. I don't think, well, there's a couple of things. One is once we release that report to the referral source, we don't really have any control over it. If we think we do, we're fooling ourselves. And um I've also seen wording in reports that seems, how do I want to say this? It seems like the report author was a little more full of himself or herself than the data would support. 
Um, yeah, I've seen people say uh, the concepts in this report are of a highly technical nature and, and nobody without proper training should read it. Well, really? I mean, sure, there may be cases where that's true, but in your typical run-of-the-mill case, you can write a report that a judge or an attorney can understand. A lot of questions specifically about the word denied. Should you use it? Is it appropriate? Sometimes the person really does deny something. Um, and I know you talked a little bit about this, but I think a lot of people are really focused on that particular word. So any thoughts on that word? Yeah, I, I think I talked about admit and I think admit and deny are different sides of the same coin. And so I would just be careful in using it. I would not say don't ever use it. Some people, you know, like you said, do deny things and, and that's the right word. I just say be aware of the connotation and make sure that you are not communicating through the subtle connotation of something you don't intend to. Mm -hmm. All right. We're 10 after, so I think we're good to go for today. Um, Rick, thank you so much. We it's really appreciate it. Yeah, always love hearing your talks on this stuff. So, um, all right, everyone, make sure you grab your evaluation link. Um, make sure you save a copy of it. And if, you know, otherwise, we'll see you all next week. Thanks again, Rick. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye.